I haven't talked much about fantasy on my channel in the past, and part of the reason for that is I haven't been into the genre since I was a teenager. My tastes in literature these days lean closer to realism and its many subgenres, but I used to enjoy reading about journeys across the wilderness, magical sword battles, spell slinging prophecies, and saving the world from dark lords and all that fantasy goodness. I'm certainly not unusual in that my tastes change over time. This happens to most people, and I'm sure that I'll eventually move on from realism to something else. However, I've always found that in my forays through various genres, while most of the stories I read are eventually discarded and forgotten, some of them really stuck, and I keep coming back to them even well after the aesthetics of its genre tend to bounce off. The last unicorn animated film was something that I watched very early in my childhood, and its imagery, characters, and themes stuck with me even after I hadn't seen the film for well over a decade. I still haven't gone back and watched it all the way through again, not even for this video, because I looked up a few clips from it and found that its audiovisual style heavily clashes with my current tastes. However, my remembrance of the film is what eventually drove me to pick up the original novel that the film was based on, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Rediscovering The Last Unicorn through its original literary form was a fantastic experience, and I would urge any fans of the film who haven't read the novel to seek it out, because it's very much worth reading even if you already know the story. And if you're like me, and don't have much of an interest in children's animation anymore, the literary version could even help the story continue to resonate for you in a form that's easier for you to appreciate as an adult. The story of the movie is incredibly close to the story of the novel, however, the film does cut several major sections. Chiefly, the village where Schmendrick is first captured by Captain Cully, the entire presence of Hagsgate, and several additional characters in Haggard's castle. The story otherwise remains incredibly faithful to the novel, which is expected since the author of the original novel, Peter S. Beagle, also wrote the screenplay for the animated film, so his vision was largely preserved in the translation from one medium to another. Speaking of Peter S. Beagle, I'd like to thank him for agreeing to let me interview him. Hi, Peter. How are you? As I said um, before we talked, I'm terrifyingly wide awake. <laughs> There's going to be heavy spoilers in this video, so it's highly recommended that you find a way to experience this story if you haven't already, either through the movie, or the book, or the graphic novel. You can choose any of these versions, however, I would personally recommend the book. Typical for me, I know, but I do genuinely love it a lot and feel like the story is at its strongest when represented by the written word. However, if you're dead set on watching this video as soon as possible and haven't experienced The Last Unicorn for yourself in any form, the animated film runs for only 90 minutes and in my opinion is still an extremely worthwhile way of experiencing the story. There will be some links in the description for legal ways that you can acquire The Last Unicorn in its various forms. Otherwise, I hope you find this video both interesting and useful. Let's get right into it. My best friend in the world, his name is Phil Sigunik, and we have known each other since we were five years old. He's always been a painter. He was always drawing the same way I was always making up stories. And when we were 23, we shared a cabin in the Berkshires where it was understood that this, we were to be extremely professional. I'd already published one book and I had no idea what to do next. And Phil would go out every day, sketching and painting in the, in the Berkshire woods. And I'd be by myself in the cabin, wanting to show him that when he got home or we cooked dinner and played our guitars all night, I was working too. And I literally started finally, after a couple of false starts, with one line. The unicorn, the unicorn lived, lived in, in a, a lilac, lilac wood, and she lived all alone. I didn't really know what a lilac wood was, and I didn't know very much about unicorns. So, okay, now what? And I started sentence by sentence making up a story about the unicorn that thinks she's the last one in the world. She is, isn't, as it turns out, but she has every reason to think so. First impressions count for a lot, especially in writing. This particular first sentence is so good at hooking the imagination of the reader that on the copy of the book that I own, the blurb uses it as well, and it's even given a prominent position above the rest of the blurb in a bold, highlighted font. The reason why this first sentence is fantastic is because it invites so many questions with such a small number of words. It provoked Peter Beagle's curiosity enough for him to 
continue writing a story out of this first sentence, and it will hopefully have the same effect on you, the reader. It may get you asking questions like, who is the unicorn? The title and blurb of the book has already told you that the story is about a unicorn, so this sentence smartly introduces the reader to the central character immediately in the first two words. The strength of the unicorn as the protagonist of this story is that her being a creature of myth already makes her interesting simply at the conceptual level. For a human character, it may take time to establish exactly what makes that particular character noteworthy enough to have a story written about them. However, readers may be naturally curious about the character of a unicorn simply because of how unusual this creature could be, and front-loading her introduction sets our curiosity ablaze immediately. What is a lilac wood? Admittedly, the question of what a lilac wood is doesn't get explored in any detailed way. However, this introduction of place not only helps to establish the style of the piece, but also provokes the reader's visual imagination. There are a lot of scenes in this book that use unusual descriptions which are not elaborated upon. Leaving the questions of what exactly does this scene look like unanswered may seem unsatisfying, however, specific visual descriptions are not very relevant to the narrative. The storytelling style is that of a fairy tale, and part of that style is provoking a childlike curiosity and wonder in the reader, including with regards to the place that provides the story's setting. Leaving the reader with unusual descriptions of locations, and using that to provoke their imagination, helps to strongly reinforce that sense of childlike wonder even in adult readers. Why is the unicorn alone? This question feeds back into the title. We assume that she's alone because she's the last unicorn, and that itself provokes even more questions. Were there other unicorns? What happened to them? Why is she the last? Curiosity explodes out of the title and the first sentence. This should hook the reader's interest and make them want to find out all the answers to these questions, which hopefully encourages them to keep on reading. I talked about how the sentence reads in tandem with the title and the blurb, because that's probably going to factor into the experience of most readers. However, you can see that even without the title and blurb, this sentence still nonetheless provokes these questions, which is perhaps why it was able to provoke Beagle's curiosity. It may seem like I'm overanalyzing one small sentence, and I am, but keep in mind that if it were not for this particular sentence, we might not have the rest of the novel. If you're an aspiring writer, you have to keep in mind that your first chapter, first paragraph, and even your first sentence are incredibly important when it comes to inspiring your audience to continue reading your work. The novel wastes no time in establishing its themes, made explicit wonderfully by the hunter who regales a story told by his grandmother, who met a unicorn in her youth. She began to cry once, telling me all about it. Of course, she was a very old woman then, and cried at anything that reminded her of her youth. Age is a theme that turns up a lot in The Last Unicorn. The unicorn herself is a duality of this theme. She's immortal, which means that she is both very old and yet does not age. Both of these traits feed into her initial characterization. She's aloof, and regards the tumultuous and temporary lives of the animals in her forest with a detached amusement. And she, like all unicorns, takes pride in her pure and eternal beauty. Unicorns are immortal. It is in their nature to live alone in one place, usually a forest where there is a pool clear enough for them to see themselves. For they are a little vain, knowing themselves to be the most beautiful creatures in all the world, and magic besides. An old hunting myth of the unicorns links the creature to the purity of female virginity, which is an antiquated notion I know, but I'm going to suspend judgement for this video. According to some versions of real life unicorn mythology, unicorns are fierce creatures that could not be captured by hunters, except they would only let themselves be captured by a young virgin girl, because according to the culture that inspired the myth, young virgin girls represent a kind of ultimate purity. I know. 
and unicorns are enamoured with things that are as pure as they are. The last unicorn incorporates part of that myth, in that unicorns will come to young girls, and also that the unicorns embody the purity and beauty of youth, captured eternally as unicorns never age. They are also probably the most sexless creature in the world, craving intimacy with other unicorns so little that, and I quote, She had never minded being alone, never seeing another unicorn, because she had always known that there were others like her in the world, and a unicorn needs no more than that for company. Even time itself is something the unicorn can simply disregard. She had no idea of months and years and centuries or even seasons. It was always spring in her forest because she lived there. Reading the life of the unicorn in the first chapter reminded me of the now extremely sparse memories I have of when I was a very young toddler, and it seemed to me like time was slow and unending. People were unknowable shuffles of names and faces, and my mind was so self-absorbed that reflecting back as an adult, I can't even say that I had any genuine connections at that age, because I don't think my underdeveloped brain was even capable of that back then. Obviously, I don't remember those days accurately or in detail, but that's nonetheless the impression that this opening chapter gives me, the existential condition of the very beginning of a person's conscious life. This is where I should say that I'm not attempting to read an allegory or symbolism into the piece, or claim that any of this was intended by Peter Beagle, who, in case you didn't know, tends to reject allegorical or symbolic readings of his works. I do not deal with symbols. That's one thing. People always find symbols and parallels in my work. I admire Tolkien enormously, of course, but I think I'm one of the few fantasy writers of my generation who knew, now that is a blind alley. There is no point in even trying to imitate that. What I particularly admire about Tolkien is that he constantly told his admirers, I don't do symbols. That is not a symbol of that. And good for him, because there are people who have made entire academic careers out of figuring out Tolkien's symbology. You may have heard that Tolkien rejects allegory in all its forms, and instead prefers to think of his works as having applicability. Put simply, if a text is allegorical, then that diminishes the freedom of the reader to interpret their own potentially more useful or personally resonant meaning from the text, because any interpretation must take the allegory into account. If we think of a text as instead having applicability, the idea that you can apply the text to many different meanings, that still allows for a reader to make an allegorical reading. However, in that case the allegory isn't held to be an intrinsic element of the text, but instead emerges from the reader's interpretation, which then also allows for non-allegorical readings as well. The same can be said for one-to-one -one symbols. I'm not going to claim that the unicorn is a symbol for a pure and innocent youth without adding subjective qualifiers, because if the meaning that the story generated for you doesn't view the unicorn in this way, my claim as to the unicorn symbolism in an objective sense necessarily challenges your reading, which I probably don't want to do if all your reading does is enrich you. I was invited to a seminar on my own work, and I made the mistake of going to hear people reading papers on my work. Damn near fell asleep. Um, <laughs> there was, a, there was a, a woman whom, whose work I knew who had written very nicely and intelligently about my writing over the, over the years. And there is a character in my novel, The Folk of the Air, who is, in fact, a very ancient goddess. She is so old, she remembers not being even a, a human figure. And her name is Sia, Athanasia. I didn't know that in Greek it, mean, it means um, ancient and beautiful, something like that. And how wasn't it really clever of me to pick that name for that char character? And then I had to get up and say afterwards, Jane... I picked that name because there was this Greek girl in one of my high school classes whom I had a big crush on. <laughs> and that was the only and that was the only Greek name I could think of. And and that and that happens more than not in my work. There's usually a reason, but it's never the reason anybody else thought of. 
I'm going to be detailing my reading of what I interpreted to be the novel's themes in this video. As I have said, I believe this novel's main theme to be aging, which the unicorn is confronted with very early after she leaves the safety of her forest to search for other unicorns. Her first major misadventure comes from a chance encounter with a woman named Mummy Fortuna, purveyor of magical creatures and illusions, who places the unicorn in a display cage for common folk to behold. Nearby, in another display cage later in the show, Mummy Fortuna wields her illusions to take on the mantle of the darkest entity known to humankind. She doesn't look like much, does she? Rook asked. But no hero can stand before her, no god can wrestle her down, no magic can keep her out or in, for she is no prisoner of ours. Even while we exhibit her here, she is walking among you, touching and taking. For Ellie is the old age. The cold of the cage reached out to the unicorn, and whenever it touched her, she grew lame and feeble. She felt herself withering, loosening, felt her beauty leaving her with her breath. Ugliness swung from her mane, dragged down her head, stripped her tail, gaunted her body, ate at her coat, and ravaged her mind with remembrance of what she had once been. A detail that I love here is Rook's proclamation that Ellie is no prisoner of the carnival. Mummy Fortuna plays the part of Ellie, whose appearance and effect on the spectators is illusion magic. However, while the show may be fake, the existential threat of aging remains. As Rook said, old age cannot be contained. And in reality, the carnival is in no way displaying the manifestation of aging, but it's there walking among you, touching and taking always. And this is the unicorn's first taste of it. This theme is incredibly evocative for me, and it's broadly applicable to many people's experiences, which might explain why the imagery of such things resonates with many readers beyond simple aesthetic enjoyment of the story and characters. But it has to be a, a human scene all the same. My favorite of my own books, I was, just gave my, my one of my two copies yesterday to a dear friend, a librarian. There I, I definitely do have you know, a monster I made up. And I do have creatures, undeniably. But what I think holds the book together is that the characters re reacting with them are as human as I could make them. Even if this is a, f a fantasy, that's the thing that especially Tolkien's imitators never seem to catch on to. The best of them do. But it's not enough to get some give somebody a magic sword and, have some and draw a map. It's never that easy. And the more fantastic it is, the more human it has to be at the same time. Part of the reason why The Last Unicorn stuck with me while most other fantasy stories didn't is exactly that. When I was immersed in the fantasy genre, my enjoyment could be largely attributed to an enjoyment of fantasy aesthetics, rather than necessarily any meaning that the stories had to offer me. And that's a perfectly legitimate reason to enjoy something. I'm not saying it's a lesser form of enjoyment to like something for its aesthetics, however aesthetic taste is far more ephemeral than finding per personal meaning in something. Like I said at the beginning, my taste in fiction changes over time. So what happens when my tastes move away from the aesthetics of high fantasy? In my experience, I simply stop enjoying the material. However, if I find a personal resonance or a meaning from the text, my own aesthetic tastes matter very little in whether or not I still love the story. The Last Unicorn struck me as a story where all the characters must contend with the loss of innocence and the decay of both body and soul. Even side characters adhere to this. Increasingly, as the novel goes on, characters are aged or decrepit in some way. The skull in Haggard's castle even talks a lot about the permeable nature of time before instructing the characters to walk through a clock to reach their goal. The world of The Last Unicorn feels aged more than any other fantasy world I can think of. I would say that this theme is the most pronounced in the arc of the main character. The titular unicorn begins the story aloof to the concerns of the mortal world, and even a fair way into the journey, she's still occasionally dismissive of the plights of mere mortals. The unicorn said, I remember once that it never mattered to me whether or not the princesses meant what they sang. I went to them all and laid my head in their lap, and a few of them rode on my back, though most were afraid. 
But I have no time for them now. Princesses or kitchen maids, I have no time. Molly said something strange then. It's the princesses who have no time, she said. The sky spins and drags everything along with it, princesses and magicians and poor Collie and all. But you stand still. You never see anything just once. I wish you could be a princess for a little while, or a flower, or a duck. Something that can't wait. The very worst thing that a unicorn can imagine is for them to be robbed of their eternal beauty and purity. The notion that it is kinder to let a unicorn die with their purity and beauty intact than to rob them of it is something that's repeated twice in the story. First, after the titular unicorn hears a story from Schmendrick the Magician about a male unicorn who was transformed into a human by a wizard. How terrible it would be if all my people had been turned human by well-meaning wizards. Exiled, trapped in burning houses, I would sooner find that the Red Bull had killed them all. This helps to reinforce the idea that it's specifically aging and not necessarily death that the unicorn finds so horrifying. It's not the cessation of the soul that is the true horror, but it's decay. Because if it decays, it loses its beauty. The Red Bull, arguably the secondary antagonist of the story next to King Haggard, is so frightening and paralyzing to the unicorn, not because it brings with it the threat of death. The bull actually won't kill the unicorn. However, the unicorn is utterly horrified by it because... The unicorn had never been afraid of anything. She was immortal, but she could be killed by a harpy, by a dragon, or a chimera, by a stray arrow loosened at a squirrel. But dragons could only kill her. They could never make her forget what she was, or themselves forget that even dead, she would still be more beautiful than they. The Red Bull did not know her, and yet she could feel that it was herself she sought, and no white mare. The unicorn was standing very still before the Red Bull, her head down and her whiteness drabbled to a soapy grey. She looked gaunt and small, and even Molly, who loved her, could not keep from seeing that a unicorn is an absurd animal when the shining has gone out of her. The Red Bull is not merely a physical threat to the unicorn, but an existential one. It causes her beauty to fade away. The bull only cares to round up unicorns, and so Schmendrick the Magician saves the unicorn from the bull by disguising her. He transforms her through magic into a human girl, and even though she is described as the most beautiful girl who ever existed, she recoils in horror at her condition. Her eyes widen, and it seemed to Molly that the bull moved in them, crossing their depths like flaming fish and vanishing. The girl began to touch her face timidly, recoiling from the feel of her own features. Her curled fingers brushed the mark on her forehead, and she closed her eyes and gave a thin, stabbing howl of the loss and weariness and utter despair. What have you done to me? She cried. I will die here. She tore at the smooth body and blood flowed her fingers. I will die here. I will die. Yet there was no fear in her face, though it ramped in her voice, in her hands and her feet, in the white hair that fell down over her new body. Her face remained quiet and untroubled. Why did you not let the bull kill me? The white girl moaned. Why did you not leave me to the harpy? That would have been kinder than closing me in this cage. The white girl said, I am myself still. This body is dying. I can feel the rotting all around me. How can anything that is going to die be real? How can it be truly beautiful? Schmendrick the Magician is quick to offer a counter-argument that the unicorn, now referred to temporarily as the white girl, in reference to her white hair and very pale skin, initially rejects. I was born mortal, and I have been immortal for a long, foolish time. And one day, I will be mortal again. So I know something that a unicorn cannot know. Whatever can die is beautiful. More beautiful than a unicorn, who lives forever, and who is the most beautiful creature in the world. For those of you who know the story through the animated film but haven't read the novel, one key aspect of Schmendrick's character that was cut from the film version is that he is the student of the greatest magician in the world, the wizard Nikos, who performed the greatest feat of magic ever known, transforming a unicorn into a human. Schmendrick was Nikos's apprentice, and was such an unbelievably incompetent magician that the great Nikos, counterintuitively, you might think, assumed that Schmendrick must have a power greater than he could imagine. 
but it was working backward at the moment, so Nikos enchanted Schmendrick so that he would not age until he had mastered his great power. Schmendrick's quest in this story is to unlock the full potential of his magic. He must not only equal Nikos's power by transforming a unicorn into a human, but surpass the great magician with an even greater feat, transforming a human back into a unicorn again. Only then will his immortality be lifted. Schmendrick the Magician therefore suffers the opposite predicament to the Unicorn. While the Unicorn was born immortal and then became mortal, Schmendrick was born a mortal and then became immortal. Schmendrick wishes to become mortal again, offering the perspective that it is better to be mortal, although he doesn't go into the fine details of it, which is probably for the better since that would not only waste time, but also open the philosophy of the book to be picked apart through argumentation by the reader. The novel isn't attempting to persuade its audience to choose mortality over immortality, so it presumes that its philosophy is true, and trusts that if readers are not on board with it, that they'll at least be willing to suspend argumentation for the sake of experiencing the themes. The unicorn's character arc accelerates into gear when she is transformed into the human girl, subsequently takes on the name Lady Amalthea, and confronts the main antagonist of the story, King Haggard, in her disguise. She's incredibly passive as a character after her change, which is commented upon by Prince Lear, King Haggard's son, who takes a romantic interest in her. Lady Amalthea's arc and her change in character rather come about through experiencing life in a mortal form, and learning that with mortality comes a suite of other experiences. Loss, regret, urgency, and the need for a romantic connection, starkly contrasting against her life as a unicorn, where she had the time to be aloof, patient, and solitary. King Haggard is an evocative villain for this story. He is an incredibly old man who is numb to everything in life except one thing. Unicorns. Time has totally eroded his soul away, and he is obsessed with immortal and eternally beautiful creatures. The Red Bull collects them for him and keeps them imprisoned in the sea, something that slowly but surely erodes the land. The story's antagonists are drenched in entropic themes of mortality and decay, and that makes them incredibly fitting adversaries for the last unicorn. After the unicorn spends some time as Lady Amalthea, the reader can get this encompassing sense of decay seeped into the land of King Haggard, and the story's urgency becomes heightened as Lady Amalthea's spirit itself transforms slowly from that of a unicorn to that of a human. Suddenly, there isn't enough time compared to earlier in the story, where the characters could be caught up in misadventures with barely a bother. This shift in tone complements Lady Amalthea's character arc. After her initial horror at her own mortality and decay, eventually all the central characters, including her, think that it would be better if she stayed human and was able to live out her mortal days. He must not change me, she said to Prince Lear. Do not let him work his magic on me. The bull has no care for human beings. We may walk out past him and get away. It is the unicorn the bull wants. Tell him not to change me into a unicorn. Prince Lear twisted his fingers until they cracked. Schmendrick said, It is true. We might very well escape the red bull that way, even now as we escaped before. But if we do, there will never be another chance. All unicorns of the world will remain prisoners forever, except one. And she will die. She will grow old and die. Everything dies, she said to Prince Lear. It is good that everything dies. I want to die when you die. Do not let him enchant me. Do not let him make me immortal. I am no unicorn, no magical creature. I am human, and I love you. You'll notice that the dialogue is very straightforward and made up of simple, clear sentences. However, the intense emotions that the words convey and the richness of the meaning that can be interpreted from this dialogue makes those simple sentences resonate. This is achieved through the framing of this exchange at the high level of the novel's structure, themes, and character arcs, not necessarily the literary form of this particular passage. This is an excellent example for why themes and structure are important to a story. Story, because it allows the author to use context to carry the meaning for highly resonant moments that otherwise use simple and direct form 
to strike right into the hearts of the audience. I talk a bit about literary form and writing techniques on this channel, and I sometimes do what are called close readings for the purpose of showcasing the technical side of writing and to give my audience an appreciation for quality and craftsmanship even in a largely subjective space like literature. But at the end of the day, technique only counts for so much. You still need substance at the core. There was a guy who came to Berkeley that summer with a reputation of having developed a technique of playing the banjo three times as fast as anybody else. But I went to hear him with a friend who was a banjo player, and the guy did play three times as fast as anybody. Superb technique, absolutely no, no soul. And my friend listened for quite a while and finally sighed and said, wow, I'd like to know how to do that and then not do it. <laughs> there are writers I feel that way about. So what ones where like you you can see they've got the technique, but like you wish you had the technique so that you, it'd just be a part of your repertoire, but that you could like apply it to something that had like substance in it. Exactly like that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. In the Red Bull's lair, the party argue back and forth about whether or not Lady Amalthea ought to be transformed back into a unicorn, and it's Prince Lear who ends up arguing that she ought to return to her original form. However, his reasoning has nothing to do with what would be best for her. Lear argues from a deontological position, arguing that the quest to confront the Red Bull and free the other unicorns cannot simply be abandoned on the grounds that it isn't how the story is supposed to go. At no point does any anyone challenge the idea that Lady Amalthea would live a more fulfilling and better existence as a mortal human. Unicorns are rather treated as some ideal that must be restored for its own sake. However, dogmatically adhering to the ideal of undying purity and beauty sacrifices the existence that Lady Amalthea wishes for. Schmendrick ends up transforming Lady Amalthea back into the unicorn, again to save her from the Red Bull, who has learned to see through her human disguise. After the bull is defeated, the victory is treated as bittersweet. I will go back to my forest too, but I do not know if I will live contentedly there, or anywhere. I have been mortal, and some part of me is mortal yet. I am full of tears and hunger, and the fear of death, though I cannot weep, and I want nothing, and I cannot die. I am not like the others now, for no unicorn was ever born who could regret, but I do. I regret. The general message that the text is offering is typical of most stories that deal with the theme of immortality. However, what makes The Last Unicorn resonate is that it goes beyond simply telling the readers of the folly of an immortal existence, and honestly illustrates the central problems of the alternative through the experience of its titular character. When the unicorn is transformed into a human and is left in utter despair at her own mortality, that reflects a part of the human experience. We are all confronted with the inevitability of loss and death, and we all have to existentially sort out how we spiritually handle the slow decay of our very beings that is, aging. Lady Amalthea learning to love, hunger, fear, and regret through experiencing life in a mortal form, and then deciding that despite the decay, that's the existence that she wants, reflects how human beings find meaning in our otherwise temporary lives. It may be dressed up in fantasy, but at the core, this tale is incredibly human. Peter Beagle describes Molly as the true heart of the story, and he's right because she's unique amongst the cast of characters in that she's an ordinary person. The unicorn is an immortal creature of myth, at least at first. Schmendrick is a magician who casts magic spells. Lear is a prince who performs grand heroic feats. Haggard is a king in command of an ethereal powerful monster, and there's an entire medley of side characters all extravagant and quirky in their own ways. Molly Grew? She's a middle-aged woman striking for her stark ordinariness in the centre of this magical fairy tale. I talked about this in the Flames review. The combination of realist and magical elements is an excellent way of providing to the reader both the grandiose intensity of high fantasy and the authenticity of real human experiences. More than any other character in the story, Molly provides that authentic human element. Molly sprang up, red from hairline to throat hollow. Where have you been? she cried. Damn you! Where have you been? She took a few steps toward Schmendrick, but she was looking beyond him at the unicorn. 
Molly pushed him aside and went up to the unicorn, scolding her as if she were a strayed milk cow. Where have you been? Before the whiteness and the shining horn, Molly shrank to a shrilling beetle, but this time it was the unicorn's dark eyes that looked down. I am here now, she said at last. Molly laughed with her lips flat. And what good is it to me that you are here now? Where were you twenty years ago? Ten years ago? How dare you? How dare you come to me now when I am this? Molly Grew is a middle-aged woman, and this outburst is because unicorns are supposed to come to girls in their youth. But she never saw a unicorn, and today, when the unicorn finally comes to her, she's old, rugged, dishevelled, and she's caught up in a gang of merry thieves and bandits living out of a wood. The reader can infer that Molly's life was probably hard, and her anger at the unicorn can be interpreted as grief over her lost time and missed experiences. This is a highly personal and spiritual plight compared to that faced by both Schmendrick and the unicorn, and you can interpret this scene to mean many different things depending on what your life experience is, which the scene achieves through representing an emotional state that's evocative and specific, while still being generalizable to a wide array of real experiences because it's dressed up in fantasy. When I watched the animated adaptation of The Last Unicorn as a child, these elements were why I remembered the movie. It rekindled itself in my mind several times during transitory periods of my life. Graduating from high school to university, moving interstate, falling into and then recovering from depression, beginning and ending romantic relationships, and many other times in my life when the temporary nature of my existence was brought into sharp focus. I hadn't watched the film since I was a child, but it stuck with me because the meaning that I got from it became even more relevant to me as a growing adult. That was the humanity at the core of the fantasy for me, and it's why The Last Unicorn was a story that stayed with me, in comparison to a lot of other fantasy adventures I had read and watched as a child and a teenager that I ended up forgetting. In rediscovering the story through the literary version, I was so happy to find the meaning that I had carried with me all those years was not not only intact in the novel, but it seemed to me to be even stronger in this version of the tale, and I think that the novel will help The Last Unicorn to continue to resonate with me for even longer. Now, I have to stress that this is only my interpretation of the text, and it's admittedly a very surface level reading, but I think it's fair to say that the story resonated with me as much as it did because the meaning I was able to interpret is such a fundamental part of the way that I spiritually experience being a human. Aging provokes both great joy and great horror in me, which I saw reflected back at me from various parts of this story. That that personal resonance is incredibly real, but was it actually intended and consciously put into the story by Peter S. Beagle? I never know that I've finished a book until I'm literally on the last lines. Oh, oh, that's it. That's it, you're finished. I've also told people, go straight through a book. Do not try to write the third draft while you're writing the first. Go straight through it or you lose the momentum. Then go back and make it look as though you knew what the hell you were doing in the first place. So that's all I've got to say about The Last Unicorn for now. I'll be posting the full interview with Peter S. Beagles on the channel hopefully soon. In the meantime, I want to recommend some reading for all of the fans of The Last Unicorn watching. The Last Unicorn The Lost Journey is an early version of the story that was overhauled into the novel that readers know and love. This version of the story is set in the 1960s and features an almost entirely different cast of characters and a different story to the version that people know today. The novel that people know, because it was made into a movie, isn't what I wrote that summer. I mean, you would recognize elements and characters and paragraphs if you knew the book. My regular publisher, um, Jacob Weisman of Tachyon Press, asked me to publish that first account all 50, 50 or 60 pages, that first version of The Last Unicorn, with an afterword explaining what that summer was like. And I did like writing about that summer. I marvel at what I wrote because I don't remember a lot of it. 
I wasn't able to get my hands on a copy in time to incorporate it into this video, however I think it might make for an interesting comparison video later on. I'm going to be reading this book, and I'll be seeing if there's anything in it that I want to talk about. So don't read this book just because you're expecting a video on it, because whether or not the video happens will be contingent on if I have anything interesting to say. However, if you enjoy the story of The Last Unicorn in any of its forms, then this could be a great avenue for you to explore an earlier version of the story, and if you're an aspiring writer, seeing the immense differences between these two versions of The Last Unicorn could be a worthwhile exercise for you. I hope you enjoyed the video, I'll see you all again sometime after March, and of course, thanks for watching.